I'm going to utilize a Zoho resource to do my presentation today. I'm using Zoho Show. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Laverne Cox. I am the CEO at Evergreen Investments. We are a real estate services company that specializes in making the home ownership journey to wealth creation simplified and uh, solution free or problem free, excuse me. Our solutions are geared to supporting a homeowner, turning their home ownership experience into a true investment. And we have been engaged in doing this for six years. Uh, our business is located in Metro Atlanta. And because we are located in Metro Atlanta, um, six years ago, we decided to start uh, in our home base and began to grow. Uh, originally, we are from New York City and we decided to take what was a combination of a 25 year journey and begin to serve what we called at the time, democratizing real estate um, and our real estate investments because we saw that as the pathway to solving some of the problems that we saw in our local communities in the New York City area which is a cycle of disinvestments. Specifically in poor black, brown communities, there is generally like a 20 to 30 year cycle where those same communities that were under uh, funded uh, and oftentimes left as havens for crime generally go through a rebirth cycle. And the people that do not get to participate in that rebirth are the ones that suffered through the 20 to 35 year period. And so we wanted to kind of challenge that concept because they, the people that I grew up with were all homeowners. Um, we come from a Caribbean background specifically. I call myself the, the mutt of the, the group because my family literally has traveled and traversed so many different islands in the Caribbean so that I don't have any one place to call home. Uh, and we found that not only do Caribbean, but also other cultural groups have similar beliefs in maintaining home ownership as a pathway for security for their families, but also for generating wealth. It's like a, a savings bank is how one person perceives it, because the long-term wealth is generated by holding on to land. And in the words of one of my mentors as a child, Oprah used to say this all the time, real estate is the one true investment that you really can't go bad with because God is not making any more land and land will always have value. And so today I'm going to share with you how our team that began six years ago with just two people has been transformed through the power of Zoho to a force to be reckoned with and we have now traversed up to 100 persons that have supported the growth of building or creating the journey to wealth creation using a home and simplifying that process uh, through, I would say, technology and data-driven solutions. So it's my little welcome. It's time to get started. I hope that you enjoy the Evergreen Investments experience. All right, so our story, as I made mention of before, began with just two of us, my husband and myself. At the time we were dating and we were in New York City. We actually launched Evergreen Investments in Metro Atlanta in 2016. And we quickly found that our number one clientele was real estate investor groups. So these are generally called real estate investment trusts, real estate investment REITs and hedge funds. And we found that that was a very lucrative opportunity for our business. And so in 2018, we launched our first two offices, one here in Metro Atlanta and the second one in, uh, actually we tried to launch three, but we only finished two, uh, one in Orlando. The Orlando and the Atlanta office really caused and exposed some of the challenges in running a business from multiple locations and also under multiple umbrellas or entities that we did not have solutions for originally. Um, I'm an old head in that my original systems that I was accustomed to was generally Microsoft-based solutions. 
So everything within our enterprise stack at the time revolved around Microsoft. Uh, and they, they left us exposed because we did seek CRM. We did seek to have business intelligence components added to our tech stack. But if you've ever utilized um, the larger giant solutions for uh, what commercial, larger commercial enterprises tend to use, they generally start at ten thousand to over twenty-five thousand dollars out of the box, not including setups or uh, any additional uh, work that needs to be done. So we originally found or stumbled into something that I, I would say, we left by the wayside back in our career when we were first exposed to it in 2008, which was Zoho. And we went back to Zoho in 2019 when we realized that we needed an a way to bridge a team that was scattered. And then by 2019, we actually made a, a decision to actually go hybrid. We did it before COVID. Um, it, it became a much more uh, opportune uh, solution, and I guess we were also forced to because the financial overhead of maintaining two offices, having two sets of managers, literally dupl reduplicating services in different locations just to maintain compliance was very taxing to our bottom line. So enter Zoho One in 2019, um, and at the time, the only thing that I started Zoho One for was Zoho People. <laughs> I just wanted to manage my people because we were so dispersed. But I had an operations manager who basically suggested and encouraged me to start using Zoho projects. And we began tracking all of the activities and all the assignments. So it was one of the first tools outside of human resource management, which was recruiting um, with Zoho recruits, Zoho people and the like, and uh, that we actually moved into the Zoho universe. So I wanna talk about the power of Zoho projects because I don't think that most people recognize a, what a powerhouse tool this really is. So because I was unconvinced <laughs> of the power of Zoho, I maintained my Microsoft Teams solution and utilized Zoho projects. So my first uh, foray into Zoho projects was a integration between Microsoft Teams and Zoho projects. And so what we were doing specifically at the time and still to this day was we were trying to manage our users' assignments, manage our vendor relationships and their assignments, and also try to create a means to track time and performance of tasks. Today, we have completely transformed our operation in that what we thought at the time was a revolutionary integration with just Microsoft Teams and Zoho projects, we found an even better and faster to adopt solution utilizing Zoho One. All right, so let me share how this all transformed. So as I made mention of Zoho projects, uh, our setup requirements to make uh, our Zoho solution work really does require that we collect certain key components of information for each and every uh, key area that we have listed here. So our users, our vendors, our expenditures, as well as our time and performance tracking measurements are part of the required setup to make a dashboard actively work. So for our Zoho Projects users, uh, we went in and at the time, I don't think they had what you see here, which is that rate per hour. At the time, we only had that cost so we were beginning to track our costs based on assignments from the very beginning and that gave us a better uh, uh, excuse me that gave us better insights to what we were actively uh, doing per project or per client uh, assignment as well as when we found and figured out because it does take some time to figure out Soho uh, that we can bring in vendors we then brought in our vendor relationships and began to assign them to some of our client deals as well. And then over the past three years, the abundance of solutions that have been integrated into Zoho projects to not only track the cost, but also do what I now understand to be cost accounting has transformed what we do and how we measure success for Evergreen Investments. So the first things first, because my 
business is not the traditional real estate brokerage model. It is not uh, real estate consulting. It is not financial services. We needed to build a solution that it was specific to how we did a business, how we service our customers, and the multiple ways that there would be transitions during the path of servicing a client. If a client decided to navigate from just the home ownership experience into becoming an investor, which we have had very uh, enthusiastic uh, investor conversions, what we needed to have in place were some templates to drive the information that we would need to collect from every uh, customer during that conversion process. So regardless of service, we then templated out all the tasks that were core to some of our services. So if you're going to set up Zoho projects to actively be robust and connected to delivering, I would say, dynamic solutions, you really need to invest time and some baseline tracking on exactly what are your core tasks that your team is doing day to day for your clients or doing within certain projects. So there is, I consider our team to be a projectized work environment. And I knew that this would be the better solution than what we used to do before. It was really ad hoc. When a, a problem or a request came up, that's when we assigned it, but we never categorized what area or what uh, specific team that this would normally uh, be organized under. And this is common for most small businesses because most small businesses start with just one or two people and you're carrying multiple hats. So it does not seem to make sense to organize yourself around teams. I would adjure you, I would even impress upon you to stop doing that. Every aspect of what you're doing is actively a separate role and it should be categorized by a separate role or a team function. So even from the beginning, um, when our group had moved from two to four people, we then began having team function roles. So what I'm showing to you right here is just one of the function templates that we have built into our environment. And this is common for real estate services where you're delivering a listing presentation because like, there's a buyer and this, um, or a buyer interested in our services. And, and it goes through not only the list of tasks that are required, but also the sequencing of some of those tasks. So some are just uh, ordered in terms of chronological st structure, and then others are specific to uh, a specific baseline and date that they need to be delivered by. So if you can, I would suggest the first thing that you're going to do is start tracking all activities. And then the second thing is to start structuring those, those activities according to organizational structures. I made a mistake in not sharing this with you guys, but I would suggest even if you are a team of two, draw out your org chart, draw out all of those team functions that your company is actively facilitating. So even when we were just a team of two and going into a team of four, we had a human resources department, we had a operations department, we had a sales department, we had a technology department. It was generally a vendor, but that is the nature still a functioning department within the company that someone was facilitating and we needed to be able to track the performance of. Next is once you have your tasks tracked, you need to start learning how to utilize the power of the, the timers within Zoho. So this is something that, uh, RJ, this is something that uh, we started to practice really heavily once our templates were uh, crafted in 2021. So in there's a timer in Click, there's a timer in Projects, and there's a trackers or third-party solutions, and this is not the third-party solution here, um, called TimeBro. And let me see if I can pull up what my TimeBro quickly looks like. And this is what it looks like specifically. So TimeBro is a third-party solution where it allows me to track everything that I do on a, a given date and then match that against my Zoho Projects calendar. So specifically, it will show and reflect everything that I've been assigned to and every activity within my organization that I'm managing. So especially for any manager or any entrepreneur, you know for a fact that you are wearing so many hats on any given day. It is sometimes difficult to kind of 
uh, determine what was actually accomplished from all of that extra busyness. Well, Time Bro was my first step towards actually discovering where losses of time and opportunity as well as money was happening in my business. Uh, last year, as I said, 2021 was the first year we began rolling this out and 2022 was the second year that we um, expanded its use. In 2022, there was also the expansion of the embed of Zoho projects within Click, which made this so easy for us to uh, have conversations, assign uh, a task to a user in the conversation and then have multiple threads because there was a way to uh, generate a conversation, generate a the communication or chat, generate also the documentation, all with one within that one click interface. So I would not have team members moving between applications as often as they used to when I had a Microsoft environment. So in my Microsoft environment, for example, I had teams for collaboration. I had my soft, my CRM or my solution. We had a, an inbuilt solution and we had to navigate outside at, uh, to these solutions. And as often as we would navigate outside, there was oftentimes data loss and data silos that were being created by this process of moving from one part of our team to another just to complete a function or to tie together some simple task or routine task. So the use of the timers the uh, within projects, within Click, or within my trackers helps me to get a better view as well as a means to begin what really analytics is there for. Analytics within any organization is there to help improve your outcomes. It is reported that anyone that utilizes a CRM will oftentimes net over an 871% uh, return, no, 77% return on every dollar invested. I mean, I think that's the number that I recall. So what we realized really quickly from just the, the experience that we had financially in 2019 is that we wanted to begin tracking our cost much more fastidiously. So we quickly tied our Zoho projects into our Zoho Finance solution. And I don't think Zoho Finance was embedded at the time. What we had to do, because even if it was, we weren't using <laughs> Zoho projects when we first started with Zoho Finance Suite. We were actually still outside using QuickBooks. So the first thing that we wanted to begin to be able to do is to pull reports that will tell us exactly whether or not we were on top of our billables, where we accurately reflecting a true uh, profit from working with our clients. And I'll tell you my personal story. I was the first one to be the martyr for our team. I oftentimes did not seek to add my number into the cost of goods sold because I just wanted to provide a service that I felt my audience would be able to pay for. That was a huge mistake because it under um, calculated what the true nature of the cost of operating my business was. And it also was a direct uh, connection to why our profits per assignment or per task or project was not producing what we had hoped. We kept on thinking volume would make it up, but at the end of the day, volume is not going to do with, with volume is not going to correct what true uh, assessment and accounting can project. So to begin with, I would suggest that if you are going to use this to recognize that your actual costs are oftentimes the things that you are not always considering. You need to consider that regardless of what type of entity that you own or are operating in, that you need to reflect a true profit in some of that rates that you are providing to your uh, your end user. So some profit needs to be inside there. In accounting terms, that's generally your gross profit margin needs to be added to your cost and then plus your overhead. So your actual cost may be someone that is actively working on the task. It may be, for example, in real estate, it's your FMLS um, fees. If you're in the state of Georgia, you have specific fees when you sell a property. 
it may be just the ongoing cost of uh, having you know, this particular uh, resource working on this task. But those actual costs plus that gross profit margin plus your overhead costs, which are what does it take to operate the organization, like the administrative expenses, all of those people that I used to call an ancillary, meaning they're they're vendors and I'll I'll pay them sometime, you know, uh, but they have to be included <laughs> if I want to be able to pay them. So I had to add those numbers back into my true rate so that my gross profit, although some people do it a little differently in terms of how they come up with their gross profit number, I literally separate them out and make them into this formula that you see reflected on the screen. Now, the reason I do this is because I wanted to start a practicing cost accounting. I will tell you that I am a finance major. I sucked at accounting. Um, I know enough to get by. I passed all my grades. Uh, and I got out with my, my degrees. But when it comes to cost accounting segmentation, once I learned about this particular tool, this was a game changer. This particular way of accounting for exactly what areas in your company or what task or what particular segments or employees are contributing the most to your profitability. I know in CRM, you can see who is most active, who closed the most deals, but those metrics don't oftentimes reflect true uh, contributions in terms of performance that keeps the business going. So when you're looking at your, your cost accounting segmentation, you can actually do a drill down even in regards to the overhead or those support layers that are helping your CRM salesperson hit those targets. So when I was talking about we have those time trackers, those time trackers can now be points of reference for my cost segmentation uh, connection. So I can now link Mr. John, Miss Sally, Miss whomever that is helping in building that overhead as part of the reason that we hit those profitability targets. Next, um, we also, and we still have entity to entities. So the way that our structure kind of works is sometimes when you have these entity to entity uh, transactions, one entity or a sister company is uh, getting referrals or we're operating most of the overhead and this other companies paying us for completing a core component of our business. And any business that tends to do uh, a multi-service or multi-pronged uh, operation tends to have these different entities that they need to track uh, cost as well as the performance relationships that are happening in each um, entity. So I don't want to get into a lot of detail there, but the entity to entity billing that I had when I was working through QuickBooks was horrible. It, it never allowed for that, that level of segmentation that's necessary for me to get and drill down specifically to um, this is what is attributed to this end uh, entity. So we had to do a lot of estimates and generally your estimates are never accurate. Um, in addition to having this uh, exposure and, and more accuracy in terms of billing, it really did help with locating like your, your best performance and your also your worst performance. And let me share with you how we did the performance evaluation component. So every system that um, is being run in our environment is connected to the core engine of Zoho One. It is connected to CRM. So not many people even understand why, and I have it up here, that why the CRM in most of our applications is the engine or the glue. So last year, I had the exposure to an opportunity to begin building what is called a competitive intelligence hub. And there's an organization called the Strategic Competitive Intelligence Professional Association that basically shared that the term that I learned many years ago that created or, or was the force behind why the CRM is the engine for the intelligence um, is because it connects what is a business term called the Portis Five Forces. It, it reflects your external, uh, your external uh, industry. It exposure, exposes what's happening in terms of your competitors. It exposes, exposes what's going on with your customer. It can literally connect extreme 
deep driven data sets to what you're actively doing on a day-to-day -day basis that will help you to manage the probable, lead the possible, and predict unpredictables. If you do not have Zoho projects connected to Zoho CRM, you're missing out on a key component of tracking your internal, what's going on in my company that is contributing to this. Because CRM is so heavily focused on sales, you really need to get down to tracking specifically what is happening within my technology, within my core resources in the company that is driving some of the outcomes that we are having. I, I made mention of this uh, before, but I can't say how important this is because CRM cannot produce good results on its own. It needs to be connected to data sets to do that. And your Zoho projects or your team um, performance or the, the vendor performance tracking aspect of how your work is done and how it's assigned and how profitable those things are is a key component of those complex data sets that you should be utilizing. So creating a project for us begins with a deal in our system. And uh, I just have a quick little uh, overview that we do this within um, Zoho CRM, where we just hit a quick little, let me see if I can hide this, a quick little integrate tool. We select who in our team is going to be actively working this. We link, of course, our work drive folders. And then we assign, as going back to those core teams, one of those core teams within the Zoho projects environment that is going to be assigned to this task. From within the task environment or the platform, the project environment, we then link a means for prioritizing and um, assigning who is actively going to manage that task. But if you don't first by don't first uh, uh, begin with connecting the key areas, creating your budget, creating the core, the key expectations with your deals, you're going to find that your process is belabored and the sequence for how your team can be empowered to improve upon outcomes is slow and inefficient, to be honest. So I would suggest remember the task templates and the structure that I made mention of before. Make sure all of those details are already in there so that they have the, the, the core pieces of information to make quality decisions to improve our outcomes. So our Zoho Projects uh, system by default has some key reporting that I think most of us are not using. And th that's true of those of us who just want to track tasks. Um, if you're using Zoho uh, Connect, our team uses Zoho Connect too, but we use it more like an intranet uh, hub. We don't necessarily use it for its analytics. The analytics in Zoho Connect does not have the capacity to do what you can do through Zoho projects. So we can do plan versus actual. We can do um, this uh, one down here is reflecting allocation, resource allocation within our team. Um, uh, uh, this other one over here is talking about what uh, users within our environment are actively uh, being, a com being tasked or responsible for completing certain tasks within our team. And the follow one down, following one down here is about the contribution in terms of profitability to completion on all the tasks within the environment. Right now, I'm actually engaged in uh, a mentorship with a business uh, consultant that's going to be helping us in building our enterprise architecture and improving our architecture. But if I didn't have these data sets, to inform her of what we've been doing, there really is no reference material for her to know and for us to know if what she's going to recommend will actively work. So our charts um, created by default in the application so that you will know some a little bit more about them. By default, you can have project and milestone reports, task reports, timesheet reports, user reports, billing reports, burn down reports, which is a, a really great way of knowing when you're your resources are dwindling for resource allocation or in regards to other resources or um, the billable hours 
that have been assigned, whether or not you're within your thresholds or when you're about to surpass it. So it helps with those projections uh, that we were making mention of before. Next you have within Zoho projects, you have data visualization. So there's different types that you can have. And the one that I haven't used this yet uh, that you can do is this baseline report. If I had known about this one, I wouldn't have done what I did, which was a manual export. But the manual export is part of what we're talking about today, which is exporting that data to um, Zoho Analytics and reviewing it. This past December, we had our, our first financial uh, challenge and we had to review exactly what within our systems was causing or contributing to some of these challenges that we were experiencing. And this baseline report um, and the comparison one where we were looking at the plan versus actual and how our team's time and attendance was being tracked really did give us a clear indication where our systems were just disconnected. We thought we were doing really well in terms of profitability on certain things and moving closer to our targets. But when we looked at the, the actual uh, specific metrics that were coming from our data, it kept on showing that we were at a shortfall in many of the um, internal tasks that we had planned. And then also when we did comparisons from year to year, we started recognizing we actually did worse in 2022 than we actually did in 2021. So 2021, we had, uh, I think, less than 20 uh, resources assigned to us. And in 2022, we had over 40. We actually underperformed with 40 resources than when we had only 20. So we went back in and we started utilizing more accurately and reflecting and looking at these reports on a, a more regular cadence. So. Now, the Zoho Analytics conversion. Now, I know this is dry. <laughs> this can be something that can be really, really uh, boring because it's like planting a seed. You literally, when you plant that seed, you know, you got to understand that that seed has potential. It's going to take some time. But sure enough, that, that seed will bring forth exactly what you planted. So, with good data in, you're going to get good data out. You put garbage in, you're gonna get garbage back out. And that's exactly what we've been doing for most of our businesses. We are wishing on a hope and a prayer without any uh, good seed to be planted. Um, when we collect good data, it's like planting a good seed. And so you wanna be careful about the information within your system that you are not tracking. And I'm, I go into great detail here because just like here, Arnold, trust me, I've been through this, I've lived this, over 25 years of doing this, I'm telling you, if you don't get this good data, you're going to have just numerous headaches and problems that you really could have uh, not experienced just with good core uh, data planning and data um, structures, data systems. So let me talk about some of these data systems real quickly so that we can start capturing uh, this information in our systems. So if you are if you are in any part of real estate, you are in a business. So you need to have some core business metrics. So you need to be tracking deal profitability. You need to be tracking workforce planning and projections. You need to be tracking how your inventory or your resources are performing. Um, how much time have you spent with downed equipment or uh, team members that are square holes trying to fit into round pegs. How long and how much of this type of activity uh, are you going to put up with? Because if you're putting up with this activity, let me tell you, all of that that you're putting up with is directly impacting your ROI because there is a there is a cost associated to all of this. So not capturing it is foolhardy because you're definitely experiencing it anyway. But by tracking it, you can now begin to rectify the areas where money is being lost and opportunities are not being um, secured. So evaluate the work you hate to do through a tool that makes it easy. We don't like, no, none of us likes to go through data. Uh, I think anybody that likes going through data, they have a special gift given by God. But those of us who just want to get the thing done, we just really want to literally be able to look at something and state, did this work? 
And so there are core formulas. An example of one core formula that um, I am currently using is uh, cost of acquisitions. So generally marketing costs, which in my uh, accounting thought was your marketing costs are the cost that you're paying for marketing services and the overhead for those marketing services. Well, oftentimes people are not including your all of the vendors. It's not including the people that do the work for creating some of that and the time, <laughs> the time it takes um, and how that time is ultimately costing you something. So we are not tracking that when somebody literally, or me, has to put on that hat to create that marketing uh, piece or that content, there is there should be a, 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 an equivalent dollar per hour that I need to be tracking as part of my marketing costs. If you're not tracking that, then you are not really reflecting a true uh, cost of acquisition. You're not reflecting what the true cost is of acquiring that customer and then servicing them. And generally, when you get that first cost of acquisition number, you want to be able to track what is the cost over a lifetime uh, of keeping that customer. And you need to be doing so by making sure that you're tracking all of your marketing spend, the marketing time, and then ultimately the sales efforts that go into keeping and maintaining this person. Some other areas that you need to be thinking about outside of that is your financial stability. Like the, not just the core ratios that you see inside your QuickBooks or inside of your uh, Zoho books. What I'm talking about is some of the ones that you're not thinking about that are directly re uh, related to how you're managing your sales. Remember when I made mention of before cal uh, calculating a better uh, gross profit margin um, and making sure that your gross profit margin is not just net sales minus cost of goods sold. And because we are not always identifying all of our cost of goods sold. Well, that is kind of where you're going to take the Zoho Projects data information and you're going to put that information back into your cost of goods sold so that you can get more accurate numbers. Your sales metrics not being easily tracked in CRM, all of this is another means of additional areas that you can uh, add some key deliverables. Now, in the real estate world, because I really recognize that I don't have a lot of time and I still haven't gotten to this dashboard, I want to talk about the key areas that most people think that they're doing extremely well on because I'm making money. Well, making money according to what and whom. So according to the core real estate KPIs, now, if you have been in business for any uh, amount of time, you know that your CRM, and for many people, the CRM that you use is the, the CRM that is most profitable. But for a lot of brokers, they love the art of the deal. They love just making the deal happen, that they're not tracking necessarily even those core KPIs that are um, pertinent to maintaining the relationship. Now, the, the core KPIs are the ones that you oftentimes will find are coming from your CRM, and they track really these three key areas, profitability, productivity, and efficiency, if you're doing, if you're tracking for those metrics within uh, 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 the system. So some KPIs that you may have heard of is your, your appointment to listing conversion rate, your average commission per sale, which is average commission per sale, uh, which equals total commission value over the number of sales. Or one that is outside of your CRM, but you should be thinking about because if you're dealing with a market conditions and planning for market conditions, you need to know if there's sold homes, <laughs> the sold homes per available inventory. If you recall, for the past, uh, in 2018, I was telling my husband this because uh, we were rolling and blowing, but I was like, RJ, there is definitely going to be a need for us to shift on who we're servicing because when it comes to servicing our, um, our Ians, is how we call them internally, they buy in cycles. And when demand is, or the cost of an asset continues to increase, and demand was very, very high or very low or marketing supply is very low, they began to reduce the number of people so they can capture more of the income from each and every sale. So what we started to recognize by just doing that calculations with the sold homes per available inventory, it was a metric to, that was especially useful enabling our, our team to understand the current market conditions that we were about to deal with. That is something that every at least month you should be doing. 
because it helps to prepare you for what just happened last month to determine how to strategize to acquire additional clients in the next month. Don't just keep doing the same thing over and over again and, and swear that it's going to work. That is not effective. And it's really, uh, it's going back to the square hole, I mean, excuse me, the square peg and the round hole. It's oftentimes us just chasing cheese that is no longer there. So let's learn and take the business intelligence that we can obtain from our systems and utilize them to plan more effectively and track our performance even more. Then you have, of course, listing souls, number of days on market. If you're in a brokerage, that is common. However, for my real estate investors, you're, you need to be tracking your, real, your return on investment, your net operating income. We need to make sure that our operating expenses are under the threshold for what's normal in our area. And notice that when I say operating expenses, how are you tracking those operating expenses? Are you only doing it through vendors or are you tracking it based on time and the overhead expenses that are going into maintaining this real estate investment business? Again, something that you need to have Zoho projects assigned to assist you in maintaining that additional tracking. Then we have the internal rate of return, cash flow, et cetera. Those, as I said before, all within CRM. You can definitely have them to give that product profitability, productivity, and efficiency metrics to make sure that you have a foundation for performance outcomes. Without it, you don't. You're literally walking on shaky ground and you won't be around, especially in light of the fact that we are dealing with a real estate market right now that is in volatile conditions. How you do when what you do right now with in regards to these real estate basic KPIs, if you're not doing them, you're going to find that you're going to be in shaky waters very quickly. If you're in, um, uh, not too many people are doing this right now, but some people are doing development. If you're in development, there are KPIs that you have to track for the development process. You have your internal rate of return that you have to pay back to your investors. You have your interest coverage ratio, uh, which is interest covered, or which is EBITDA, or EBIT uh, over interest and expenses. You have your real estate demand growth. Remember, we always want to capture some external market uh, information to inform us as to whether the population trends, the construction permit ecosystem, the mortgage application rate, or the growth of or decline of those rates is going to impact our business, okay? As, and as well as normal uh, ratios, which is cost per square foot. Now, once you have those, most people would be like, I'm done, I'm done. Just show me how to do the dashboard. But that is not so. When you are in real estate, you have to remember that there are other real estate KPIs. And those other real estate KPIs are the difference between wealth being created and wealth being lost. So a lot of us are going to find that there are a lot of people that were in the real estate industry because they came in when the things were blowing and going and they don't have the ability to sustain themselves during volatile conditions because they are not taking into consideration these other real estate KPIs. Now, the other real estate KPIs are also three, um, they, they, go, they cover three functional areas. And I call them the risk management KPIs because these targets are and should be reviewed on a quarterly basis because they help to inform how a real estate portfolio can be sustainable in volatile conditions. Now, any real estate, any person that knows real estate knows this story. Uh, I would love to hear from you if you could say it. Who knows the story of um, the, the New York billionaire, Larry Silverstein? Do you remember Larry Silverstein bought the World Trade Center, you know, weeks before it, uh, the 9-11 attacks? Now, because I was in New York at the time, I tracked this story because I was like, this man is not going to get his money. <laughs> he is not going to get his money. But he literally um, had this particular um, practice in place. And I found this to be true for a lot of uh, the New York uh, real estate and itself, as well as the financial firms that I came from. They normally have a common practice uh, as part of their um organizational structure where you protect every dollar invested. So it doesn't make sense to capture a dollar and then have that dollar exposed. So any dollar that's exposed is a dollar that's lost 
and a dollar that can actually create more losses than what was just captured. So a common practice in every business was to protect the investment, the investor and the idea before you even ink your deal. So the way that this is done commonly in real estate businesses is that you want to track three core areas, your risk, your resiliency, and your ability to recover. Your risk, your resiliency, and your ability to recover. So your risk to consider when you are literally managing a physical asset is that you're going to have a potential and unexpected loss. So in risk management, you need to consider that risk come under three categories. There is novel risk, system failure risk, and catastrophic risk. So Silverstein experienced the catastrophic risk exposure. And these are the risks that you cannot see. I actually have a Harvard Business Review article that I can share with you guys so that you can begin to learn how to capture the numbers for these risks. And then there's common risk that you should consider. Consider anything that has a physical or is called a capital asset, it has a physical uh, structure to it, can be damaged. So you have common risk that should be reviewed periodically. So with real estate, it's your environmental risk, your political risk, your industry or diversity risk, market risk, your data and technological risk. And so if you haven't heard that we are all operating in this digital age, and part of that digital age means that we have to reduce the barriers that are contributing to us losing uh, capacity to retain our market share in our industry means that we need to begin to understand the data that's coming from the market. We need to bring in that market data into what we are doing so that we can better understand it. So I know that I um, I'm a CCIM member and annually CCIM does a really great job of informing uh, their members of key industry metrics. Most of us hear the data, we sit down at the dinner and we leave thinking that that was all that was ne necessary to do. Unfortunately, that was the beginning or the precursor to now protecting your business. So taking the risk evaluation that it's provided means that you now have to begin to put into place things that are going to protect this. So if you're talking about your uh, resiliency, you have a site with a uh, whether you're in management or physical development, you have the site that needs to be protected. So you need to look at that site periodically with commercial real estate. I know that many of us may not necessarily be doing this right now, but with commercial real estate, that's looking at how the land, water, electricity, internet, air rights, et cetera, can be affected. What are those stressors? Do we have redundancies in our system? And what are some environmental hazards that can disrupt some of what we do on a, a, a consistent basis? I cannot tell you how many times I've been in uh, office buildings and their internet or their electricity or their roofing, or it was just nonsense in terms of management when it came to their risk uh, redundancy standards in maintaining their real estate. They're concerned about getting the rent, but they're not concerned about reducing these risks. That is an error because your tenants are going to leave. Okay. Same is true if you are managing residential real estate. It's just that you don't have to do it as often. You're going to possibly do like an annual plan, and then you're going to put those costs and redundancies into a plan so that you know what to do to maintain either insurance coverages or maintain the guidelines to protect yourself. How quickly can I switch if, if, if my business is uh, compromised due to one of these things? So under a risk management guideline, we calculate all of the cost of having these redundancies. We calculate the cost of having the additional insurance to protect us. We calculate that recovery time. It took Silverstein over three years fighting with the insurance company to get that money that he was owed for the investment in um, the World Trade Center back. Now, most of us would have lost our shirt even taking this to court even though we had the insurance in place. So when we are talking about recovery, we need to also put into effect the cost of what it takes to recover, meaning the timeline to recovery. This is how much is this going to impair my ability to make money? So Mr. Silverstein could have gone from Silverstein to Silver Broke if he did not already have these things in, in uh, captured within the original ink of his deal with uh, 
the, the purchase of the World Trade Center. So nominally, these are added to your project task. They are added to your project plans and you're, you're added to your metrics and your thresholds. So your metrics and thresholds that I just made mention of within Zoho projects that you're looking at is you want to bring all of that data in from that plan. That risk management plan is literally a project within my environment. I bring the, those annual compliance and then we push that data and we now do a bridge of that data to other areas of our business so that we can have true cost relationships. So what you're going to do, and I'm not going to do it with you, is you're going to build a dashboard. And because my me doing so on this camera is going to expose way too much about what, how my business is working, I didn't build one for you guys to see. I do, however, have a resource for you to do so. I am extremely diligent when it comes to research. And when I'm trying to learn something, regardless of my training, I make it my business to go out and secure as many resources that can make it as simple as possible. So in regards to the Zoho Analytics dashboard, the best one that I found out there was actually done by um, Zanata Consulting. Uh, it was their 2022 uh, Zoho Analytics review. And they go into explaining the core, the, how to create your data tables, how to configure and match one data table, meaning like if you're taking data from in, inside of CRM, that data table that's going to come, it's going to only have information that's housed in CRM. But if you now need to do a comparison report or have a lookup to uh, marketing campaigns related or maybe even the whole social data, you can then use a, a simple aggregate or lookup formula to pull that into your new table to begin building these metrics. So a lot of this, I'm telling you, this is simple. When they explained this, I've gone to, sorry, Zoho, but I've gone to a lot of the Zoho trainings and it was not that simple. It was not as simply as explained as I saw in this uh, resource. So you're gonna create your data tables and you're gonna configure them uh, table by table, widget by widget to begin to compile your overarching view. Now. The data table should take no more than five to 10 minutes to do if you have all of your metrics that I just kind of talked about in one location and you have your core systems or your core applications tracking those metrics over time. Five minutes, five minutes to pull in the data, five minutes to begin building the new table. And then the, I tend to take a long time with design, maybe 10 minutes to finish up the design and make it look pretty so that you can have a, a full dashboard that can begin to inform you of how your company is operating under the multiple KPIs that we just made mention of. Each of your core uh, KPIs should have a, 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 a formula or a key number that is reflected into your team dashboard and your management dashboard that will help to build and um, not only build, but help to inform how your company is doing at any given time. Uh, as part of the Zoho uh, Analytics build out, I just want to make mention that the build out uh, does not have real time re uh, reflection, but it does have close to real time. It takes three hours to get that data back to you. So within three hours, you can see exactly where your company is based on all of those other metrics that we just made mention of. And that's more than enough than many of our businesses uh, are even giving ourselves an opportunity to uh, reflect on and to review. So this kind of comes to the conclusion or the end of my presentation today. I thank you guys for listening to me. And if you have questions, I'm an open book. You know, feel free to ask them. I don't know if we have enough time to do so today. But Janaki, I'm handing it back to you. I don't know how much time you put into that, but that was excellent. Um, in 1977, there's a guy named Michael Gerber who wrote a book called The E-Myth. And what you just described is his entire book. Um, if, for people, you know, this, this real estate group is a relatively small group. Uh, I wish it was bigger and, and maybe one day everyone will find out about it. Uh, I would encourage both Sush and uh, Janika to, I would, I would record this and put this 
on the Zoho website, not just real estate, because what she has described is the way to run a business, not necessarily the way to run a real estate business. And, you know, we've seen people pop into the forums and say, hey, I'm trying to do a blueprint and I want to track this workflow and all that. I have done a lot of the things that you have done, Laverne, with the project. In my opinion, Zoho CRM, Zoho Projects, and Zoho Books, with those three products right there, you can run a business. And a lot of the things that we see people wanting to write custom code to do is in Zoho Projects. It's in there. You don't have to write code to do that, but I can't, I can't compliment you enough on what you just did. That was great. That's all I got. I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. I have definitely lost sleep doing this, but I'm grateful that it's done. <laughs> and it's been, uh, it, I'm hoping that everyone would take this as a true resource because I, I'm telling you, so many of us don't have to experience these ups and downs that we keep experiencing in our real estate world. And so I appreciate the, the encouragement that you just shared. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> nah, nah, man, I'm over here speechless, man. I'm, I'm still just, uh, yeah, yeah, that was that was uh, that was next level. That was absolutely on the next level. I literally feel like I just graduated from MIT summa cum laude. I can go to SpaceX and apply for a job right now. I feel like <laughs> that was awesome. Absolutely awesome. Thank you, Laverne. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. Oh, um, I'm going to drop in the real estate channel the the links that I, I did uh, make mention of, the Competitive Intelligence Hub, as well as the um, the Harvard Business Review articles and the Zoho Zenata one. I'm telling you, we keep on thinking that I was right there too with Zoho Analytics. It looked like a whole new world to me. But once I found that Zenata consulting um, recording, it's so simple. It's so, so simple. That was wonderful. Thanks again, Lavan. That was a brilliant uh, presentation today. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. You and know, I hope so you have we, we do a lot of customization. What did you think about the presentation? Oh, I'm sorry. Was that for me? Yeah. Oh. No. It's it was awesome. I actually, Laverne, I do have a question. So we're in the process of building out um, just our automations within CRM. And the, the idea that you, it sounds like you're doing all of your tasking and project management in projects versus kind of building out all of that within CRM. Is that, is that correct? Um, we run a projectized environment, but no, not all of our tasks are um, within, they're not all connected to CRM. So just core, I would say core service templates are within um, Zoho projects. An example of a trackable task that does not necessarily always confine it. Remember, we were talking about baselines. So we have a customer support team that helps us on answering telephone calls, for example, and, and managing our tickets. So a lot of that is being done within Zoho Tickets. Zoho Tickets already has a, a time tracker, um, but because we want to pay them for, uh, because they're independent contractors and not employees, we want to be able to pay them. We do push a report or a, a an aggregate report on a weekly basis from them. They do log it daily, but it's an aggregate report of what they did in those areas so that we can use that to determine, you know, ups and downs. There is some things that I feel like you will have to um, do custom because the Zoho projects does not necessarily, or Zoho desk or Zoho CRM does not out of the box have those um, areas where that is being tracked. And you, we initially start with a baseline of what we want to track and see if we can figure out a, a metric, a, a link, a field, or something that can help to begin the convergence for tracking either time or tracking costs within those environments, then then begin to push it over. And nobody, by no means, Amy, <laughs> that we're 
finished with any of this. This takes a lot of time to do. And even when I said that we've grown to a team of 100, I did not make mention of the fact that our team really began to grow in such large numbers because we utilize the power of internships. And I find that there's a huge opportunity with um, within the United States with uh, international interns that are just looking for learning opportunities. And I remember, and RJ will also attest to this, that even though when we when we got our degrees, we could not find work because we graduated in volatile times similar to what uh, other people are kind of experiencing, where you have the training, you have the degree, but you don't have the experience. And so giving those people the, the opportunity to spend six weeks, six months, et cetera, with us really has transformed our businesses in terms of new ideas captured and then opportunities to begin baselining what our systems can do. Because when we were just a small team, it's kind of difficult to determine capacity and capacity planning. It's, you don't have enough resources to add that data reference for. Mm -hmm. So it, this really is a great way to grow as well. Laverne, and, I will uh, bring up one more thing that we've seen in the in the uh, forums before is is people asking about uh, having these custom modules to track uh, projects and what happens if a closing if they've scheduled a closing on Friday the 13th and there's a whole flow of what's supposed to happen before today and Friday the 13th and then the closing gets moved to Friday the 20th how do you, you know how do you go about rejiggering everything and obviously by using projects it does the waterfall for you do you want to explain that a little bit more um absolutely so we don't we did not build out a lot of this is our first year building out automations in crm and last year was the reason that we began to develop more heavily i'll be honest with you it was a it's a lot of information that you can capture in crm and when we first started to do it the uh automations that we were building we thought were great we thought they were phenomenal and then we went to that conference uh and i'll drop a youtube video for that uh service mark i believe i think i have a reference for it as well but anyway she goes through building what these larger uh fortune 500 and the medium size companies are doing in terms of building these competitive intelligence hubs. And when she went over the necessary key components to building the hub, I was I was shocked that we literally were tracking the wrong thing in our CRM. And if your CRM has garbage inside of it or these automations that don't capture uh, data accurately, it is going to throw off every analytics tool that you're going to connect it to because the way that it's capturing information does not allow our broker, our sales agent, or whoever is interacting with it to modify based on what's actively happening with the customer. So what you're talking about right now with you know having just the templates and just having a cadence, we can have a, a, a report where there is a planned versus um, a plan versus um, actual where we'll see, well, we were supposed to close within one day, but we're off by a day. And we are we can have those types of reports, but it does not, uh, it, it may contribute to me maybe a, a cost, but not necessarily into messing with the key uh, data being collected inside of Zoho CRM, because we are only collecting the core needed data within that tool and not necessarily fluff. So. Uh, I know that this may not necessarily be very specific, but I hope that I'm giving some context to where sometimes building a lot of custom modules is not beneficial. Uh, we do have custom modules in our system. I do try to reduce the amount of custom modules that we have by you know, building uh, using Zoho Creator as the glue. That's what they call the Zoho Creator is your mortar for things that you can't necessarily uh, accurately collect inside of Zoho CRM. And we are looking to build out like vendor management where th that tends to be a little bit off uh, cadence than with our customers, uh, with our CRM system. So even in task, it's kind of difficult for us to build out specifics as to how one type of vendor will operate with us versus another. Whereas 
in our creator application, we can do a lot more complex scheduling and um, contract management and not and only report what's necessary to CRM based on what's beneficial in terms of that sales relationship and the sales profitability. Going back to, again, what are you collecting is efficiency, profitability, and um, what's probable uh, so that our CRM can give us those, in, those key metrics to inform our decisions. So Ben and Bo, you guys do some pretty cool stuff also. What do you think about this? I'm here. Um, so I unfortunately just caught the, the last 10 minutes, you know, right after the, the Goldstein story or uh, Gold broke. Got that joke. <laughs> but I thought it was incredible. I really wish I got to see the, the beginning of it. So I'm, I'm, I can't wait for the recording. I do already know that I want to redo my video. Mine was terrible in comparison, and I would like a redo. <laughs> Yours taught me something too, Bo, so please, I, I'm, I'm learning from all of you guys. But thank you guys for the encouragement. It, it really does help. There's a lot of heavy lifting in this entrepreneurial world. And I love the, the fact that this real estate user group really is willing to share really what's happening in your personal environments to help another business, you know, either in the same market or, you know, in a completely different market than you to grow. And I'm grateful that you guys gave me the seat and the attention to share what we have been going through here. Oh, come on, Ben. But thank you so much. I see that Ben said my mic isn't working. Thank you very much, Ben, for the, the, uh, the, the nice words in regards to the, the presentation. I hope that we can all use it because I'm definitely learning uh, how to use it on a day-to-day -day basis. If I'm, I learned it, but now using it and finding out what those key metrics are is definitely a a process and it's definitely one that i i see rj's here with me um he knows i stress him out a lot in regards to uh we got to make a change you know we got to review this system again you know it's not doing what it needs to do and now we're just encouraging kind of what i learned from the uh video last year is that we need to empower our team to be able to make those changes and so we have had transaction support team members that just a, didn't know what to do, and that's because of poor training. And then B, did not have the right tools to, to do it in. And that's just due to poor system planning. So now we're trying to make sure that our system is more robust so that it is, is flexible enough for them to be empowered to make those informative decisions um, when the system may be either glitching or we just didn't mm -hmm. recognize that this was something that could potentially happen. And now we need to track that information within our tools. Um, the question is about uh, job descriptions. And so you, you, I think you mentioned that in the beginning, you started working with Zoho people. Um, and so I'm interested to find out which you prefer for job descriptions. So people or project? Very interesting. I think what you want to do in Zoho projects is much more task and skill based. So we do going back to those organizational um, teams. So we do have those organizational team structures. So we try to group based on the core requirements for each of those groups. Uh, in Zoho people specifically, we house all of our and we, it's still let me just say much. I my master's is in organizational development. And then the, the uh, operating manager that we had before, she, hers was also in the same field, but she was definitely much more like operations based. And so when she informed me that I should be tracking more heavily at, um, my people and their skills and their skill training, uh, we began to utilize Zoho people to begin building a framework. We still haven't finished it. It's it's still a work in progress. Literally, I have four people I need to promote, and I it is a uh, it's it's complicated because I have to have a system for mapping when someone moves from level one to level three to level four to level, 
And we, you literally have to plan that. And generally in a larger organization, you have teams of people doing this. Uh, in my organization, I'm very flat um, in terms of hierarchy. So I, I'm often involved even when I have uh, HR interns or other HR staff helping me and other managers helping me, it's still difficult. And right now we're down one manager. So it is challenging to go in and build the forms that can build the, um, I would say the, the means to inform you when someone is reflecting uh, a skill up or a level up in terms of capacity to do more. But at least with Zoho projects, I'm tracking that they are doing those activities. So I can always go back and go and reference um, that activity in a specific area. So uh, according to my training as well, Zoho projects or projects and project management is why most people go to Zoho projects and they're thinking that a project by definition has to have a beginning and an end date. Well, we take everything and projectize it. So even our ongoing operation. So we have a human resource channel that we uh, take all of the milestones that are required for the uh, management of the human resource function, and we split them into uh, monthly monthly goals that we're tracking. So if someone is doing a key function, let's say, for example, we're right now in a recruitment season. When they're doing that specific function, we are tracking that based on just as if we were the recruiting agency. And we're going row by row, seeing exactly what it takes to bring in that new hire. Then when the new hire comes in, what does it take to train them up? How long does it take for them to become active? Because then we actually have start and end dates already because they're working and they're training through all of these key metrics that are within these projects. So I can get a better reflection of things that I did not know before because I now have start and end dates for each aspect of the evolution or the growth of that, that, uh, that employee. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I've got another question. Mm -hmm. um, yes. What does RJ do around that joint? <laughs> <laughs> RJ, talk for yourself. RJ, talk what do you yourself. do around that place, man? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I can't <laughs> Good to hear from you again, man. Good to hear from you. Right. That was one wonderful uh, session today. I really enjoyed every bit of it. I'm going to share the entire video as it is with all of you, even the questions and the the way uh, things have been discussed here. It was brilliant. Thank you again. And Bo, definitely your presentation was good. No doubt. So thanks again to Bo. Uh, thanks to all of you. So next month we have Ivan uh, who has agreed to share his uh, you know details as well as amy has also uh, you know agreed uh, to share her uh, digital journey so that will be in the month of may uh, so yeah looking forward to it it is an amazing experience this year uh, than me talking you know understanding how all of you are using it, it is giving a lot of ideas to us also thanks again uh, all of you have a wonderful day bye bye and we'll continue the discussions in the re channel